Welcome to Creatives in Quarantine. I'm Tawana Floyd, your host. This week, I speak with wardrobe stylist Genevieve McLaughlin Giles, who refused to let a pandemic ruin her special day, executing a perfect small social distance wedding in spite of COVID. Here's Genevieve. It was the best unexpected planned wedding. Yeah. COVID wedding that I mean I'm doing I'm going to do a post. I'm waiting for my official uh pictures to come back. Okay. I need everyone to understand. Long gone are the days of spending tens and thousands of dollars on weddings. We're about to jump right in. Everybody, this is Genevieve (laughs) McLaughlin Giles. She just got married during COVID. So since we're having this conversation, we are here. Welcome. Talk about it. Yes. Um, so what I was saying is that like long gone are the days of spending tens and thousands of dollars on the wedding. We had a big wedding plan for September 20th back in Charlotte, North Carolina. Mm-hmm. And then um, of course COVID hit and we knew we couldn't have this big wedding. So I was procrastinating with planning it. But then I saw Elaine Welteroff's um, what Brooklyn Stoop wedding and I was inspired. I was like, Ooh, so my creative juices started flowing and we were like, okay, we need to get married outside. Like we want to do, we don't, we don't want to do anything inside. So I thought about, I had always thought about Pasadena, Pasadena City Hall. Oh yeah, it's beautiful. It is beautiful. I mean, yeah. I've never been to Santa Barbara, but I heard Santa Barbara was beautiful. But then I was it's like, the logistics yeah. of traveling, you know, getting hair and makeup and all those people down there. I was like, listen, I don't want to do all that. But I was like, Pasadena City Hall is just as beautiful. So I contacted them and they were basically like, do as you please. Like, you know, I mean, it's, it's open to the public. So right. got in contact with my pastor. She agreed to marry us. Um, one of my good friends, Sandra, flew in from Atlanta and basically was like the wedding planner. And we had, I think, 10 to 12 people at the um, ceremony. And then we had a little reception at a friend's house in the back- backyard with a DJ, chicken and waffles, shrimp and grits, portos, sangria, champagne, mm-hmm. lemonade, water, <laughs> and a cake. Yeah, right. Um, decorations. I did have a florist. Mm-hmm. Uh, I had, well, actually I actually had two florists. I had a florist who did my bouquet and a couple of ceremony pieces. And then I had a bomb for- also, they were both black. I had a bomb floors do my headpiece. I can't wait till y'all see this headpiece. Oh, that headpiece, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to put it in here because that headpiece was sick. Oh my goodness! The young lady, her Instagram is the Petal Effects. Whew, she, she blew my mind. Like I had a vision, and then she took it times ten. So, but I know, like this small wedding. I, we couldn't have spent over six thousand dollars, and that's oh, I'm, wow. I'm, I'm, I'm adding a few. I'm pretty sure I'm adding a thousand to it, but like just legit, like yeah, it was it was so inexpensive and it was so beautiful. I mean, of course, we didn't have our mothers there. That was one thing that mm-hmm. was ha- hard, but mm-hmm. we didn't want to like ha- have them travel. It was just too much. I mean, we're still no. trying to respect the pandemic, but um, yes. yeah, long gone are the days of breaking the bank for a wedding that's right and i think you you know it's really it's i don't know if it's perfect that it happened during the covid but because everybody is like like pulling back and getting back to brass tacks and bare bones of things and being just real that's the type of wedding i think that people are going to go for well not everybody but you know people are going to go for for those very simplistic weddings and i have to be honest um I'm pretty sure if we had more money, you know, to splurge on certain things, we we might have. But when I think about it, I'm like, first of all, the wedding is just for other people. Like, this is a marriage between two people. And people get lost in that, right? People get lost in that. And that was one thing that, you know, I'm grateful that the pandemic did help myself and my fiance because he he was the one who wanted to have the bigger wedding and mm-hmm. between you know prayer and therapy I conceded yeah. no I'm joking but um I get it because he wanted he has a huge family and he wanted everybody to attend mm-hmm. but when you start adding up the cost per plate and then you know 
Yeah. I was, I was, uh, if you want to have an open bar and it's just, mm-hmm. it's, it's so much. So COVID, Rona sat our asses down and was like, you're going to do it this way. And mm-hmm. it, it blew our minds. It, w- it was magical. It was beautiful. I'm, I'm, I'm still, I'm a week and a day in and I, like, I feel great. I'm like, let's do it again. <laughs> Oh, yeah. And it's been wonderful to watch because I've been watching you post about <clears throat> the engagement, then then the wedding is coming, then Corona hitting and, and feeling sad about it, then a turnaround. So it's been really re- rewarding for your audience to watch <laughs> on Instagram and see it go from the beginning stages. All Because I remember the, the engagement was a surprise, wasn't it? Yeah, the engagement was a surprise in Paris. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Yes, he surprised yeah. me um, by proposing to me at the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Mm-hmm. Um, so he 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 does it big. I I, I appreciate that man. He he knows mm-hmm. he knows how to do it big. Yeah, but that was two years ago. Like, well, almost two years yes. ago. That was twenty eighteen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it was twenty eighteen, and then uh, we just took a few months. A, a lot of smart people who had been married before had told us, like, don't go straight into wedding planning. Enjoy the engagement. I love it. We took that advice and we didn't start planning until like late. Well, I would say early spring of 2019. And then, mm-hmm. you know, we picked the date for 2020 and that's how we got there. But cause we were also like, listen, I don't care if we have to get two jobs, like we're paying everything cash. We're not charging nothing. Love it. That's right. So that was another reason why we had pushed it out to September, 2020. Mm-hmm. Um, and also to get married in North Carolina, nobody's trying to get married in the summertime because we'll all just know. I mean, September was Hot a game, but we should see. <laughs> yeah. So. Um, I, I love the idea that you guys <laughs> decided that you're not going to start the, 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 the wedding and the marriage off in debt from a wedding to, to please other people. It's I'm really telling smart. You. I'm telling you, I'm so grateful. My, I, it was my cousin Shamika who really like schooled us. She was like, listen, we shot like I mean, what what, what you rushing for? Like enjoy like the fact that yeah. you took this milestone. Like you went from girlfriend and boyfriend till right. to and, and you know fiance. And um, I'm I'm glad we did because we also were able to work out some kinks within the relationship, right? Because I think right. people get that part. People get real caught up in planning this wedding to where they forget like there's still a relationship going on and you still have to work and you know, you're still learning and things of that nature. So mm-hmm. yeah. As you bring that up, I just started binge watching girlfriends all over again because I was a fan when it first came out. Cause that was my life, me and my girlfriends. Can we speak on it? Nara Brock O'Keele, she knows how to write women boy. <laughs> um, but I'm at the part where Joan Tracy Ellis, Tracy Ellis Ross's character is just now met. I forget his name, but Malik Yoba and she's trying to get married. And they only been dating for like two weeks and she's yeah. devastated. And then they get engaged because she kind of like forced it, the idea on him. They and then he, he surprised her with a trip to Vegas, right? Were they going to Vegas? He surprised her with a trip to Vegas and she they thought she was getting Vegas. married, got a dress yeah. and everything. And no, that's not the case. But then he wound up proposing to her anyway. But then he don't want kids and that's all she wants. And it's like, yeah, because you didn't have any kind of conversation. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, that, uh, so crazy it's so Tawana people first of all I don't know if you get this being in a relationship people think you have the answers especially in this day and age because you know the way society is rocking nobody's really taking relationships as serious as they used to be things have changed you know to each own but the one thing I tell anybody who asks because I don't offer advice anymore Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) talk have 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 those conversations ask those yeah. questions because the one thing i think Darrell and i really really had to like chisel at we have families who molded us we're not just our own there were opinions how we were right. raised and things of that nature so yeah. we had to really you know work at okay why is he this white way why is she that way you know mm-hmm and dig deep we're not just who we are just by happenstance so yeah like i mean those questions and it's unfortunate because i think women um tend to be um 
we 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 passive, tend to be timid passive, because we, we don't want to think so bad and we yeah. don't want to rush things but the reality is like time waits for no man and yeah. if there are some things that you're just not gonna budge on like if you want this and that your significant other is not willing to give it to you it doesn't make them a bad person it doesn't make you a bad person it just doesn't work yeah peace out chicken sprout <laughs> Chicken sprout. I've never heard that before. <laughs> that North Carolina. That North Carolina term. No, I think my old boss used to say it. But I, oh, I okay. love a good old saying. See you later, alligator. After a while, crocodile. Yeah. Wow. Over the I'm just you seen raccoon. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, but yeah, you're absolutely right. That's the part. Um, me and my boyfriend, when we first started dating, because we dated for eight months first, and then it, and, and it didn't work out well. We weren't ready. And then we came back to each other two years later. But during that first term, most of our time was spent sending long form emails and just so there's something about writing a letter where you can really put your heart out there and you can really just be vulnerable and also um, just express how you're truly feeling because you don't have that person in front of you or normally you're nervous or whatever if you're somebody who's afraid to communicate. So we have these long, long conversations through email and then we see each other on the weekends because our schedules didn't work during the week. But um, then when we came around a second time, uh, and it's like, it's so funny because when a man knows that he's ready it's such, it's such a drastic turnaround that's like, oh, those other guys in the past, they really wasn't interested in me. I thought they were, but this is what it looks like. It's very clear. Yes, yes. Darrell and I had a similar situation. We dated back in 2012. We've been knowing each other for, if this is 2020, 10 years. I think oh, 2009, okay. 2010. We still, we can't pinpoint it. On our website, like he wrote our story of how we met and we're like, yo, we still don't really officially remember how we met. But we know, like I checked the hotmail, my hotmail email, and there was an email from him from 2011. So I'm like, oh, we've, we've been rocking for a very long time. But yeah. similar, like we dated in 2012. I wanted more, he didn't. Um, mm-hmm. And then, you know, we, we remained friends and then we stopped talking, but whatever, we got back together. But honey, when we yeah. got back together, when I'm telling you, he won Boyfriend of the Year 2016, 2017. <laughs> then we got engaged 2018. So he was fiance of the year 2019, 2020. He is husband of the year. Like, I'm like, yeah. dude. And it's, it's interesting. And I always tell, I'm like, listen. But I, one thing I've learned during this pandemic is not to take things personally. And I wish I'd mm-hmm. learned that years ago because then some of these relationships that didn't work out and I was like girl it's not you right you're not, you're not compatible y'all were not meant to be and it's okay right we over here crying our eyes out trying to make some work it's just, it, it does not it doesn't fit it does and not it's okay fit. and yeah. I, I wish I'd have learned that I would have avo- avoided so many heartaches but same here I but, think it made me stronger and who I am and you know right. I can mm-hmm. pass it on to the younger generation. Like, exactly. Oh, it's okay. Yeah. It's okay and then too. when it's really clear, it's crystal clear. Crystal clear. clear. It's yeah. crystal. So yeah. now segueing and transitioning into who you are, I know Genevieve to be a stylist. I know you through Crystal Lee Brown, who will, I don't know at what point, but I interviewed her as well. And we spent Thanksgiving oh. dinner together one year and loosely kept in touch, but not really. Right. Um, but I'm trying to remember what year that was. I think that had to be like 2013, 2014. It had to yeah. be years, like years ago. It was, yeah. it was a while ago. Mm-hmm. It was a while ago. Yes. But, and it's interesting because I don't even think in 2000, when, when we met Thanksgiving, I wasn't officially a stylist. Like, I didn't have my business. My, oh. I had been styling all my life, right? Mm-hmm. Um, I was the one who people would call girlfriends be like, girl, what, what do you think I should wear with this? Or I don't, I don't know what to wear to prom. Like I need mm-hmm. help and things that make your family. And it was something I've always been interested in, but not, did not take it serious. And I think also the issue was, I didn't know of any stylists. Like no one was speaking about. Yeah. Stylists right. That That's a job. Yeah. Right. right. Um, I can get paid to do this. Um, okay. Um, mm-hmm. It's interesting because I watched, the remix about um, Misa Hilton so and Dapper good. Dan. And I was just like, had 
had the media and the powers that be did them right back then, there would have been plenty more people of color in the game. Mm -hmm. But we just did not know, like, like they weren't covering it and things of that nature. So I didn't start taking silence like more seriously until June Ambrose came along. But then Mm -hmm. she was also one of a kind it still was just like june and then when i started learning about other stylists it was just like june was just like this one black stylist and then you know it was rachel zoe and all these other big white stylists that i just mm. I, I, I just didn't think a little brown girl myself could do that and mm. then um i had a friend who was a caterer or who is a caterer sorry here in la and i said how did you like start doing she said girl i just started cooking she was like just do it just do it just do it. She was like, I started cooking. I would host people at the house. I would have them eat it. I would have them, you know, talk about my food on social media. And then they would spread the word. And I started doing a small dinner party. And then my smaller dinner parties turned into, you know, larger parties and then weddings. And then eventually I started catering for uh, TV shows and, and movies. And she just, now she does it all. Like, I mean, she has a, um, she has a, a contract with the city where she does senior meals now. Oh, um, that's she, great. She's so dope. But like, she literally was like, just do it, G. So I start, just started doing it. And it's interesting that you mis- mentioned Crystal because she was like one of my like first few clients. Like she was like, yo, I believe in you. I know you can do this. Like, let's get mm-hmm. it. So I've styled, I styled her early on. She still is my client. So, mm-hmm. but that's how I got into the styling game. And then 2018, I quit my job and started doing it full time. Oh, wow. I remember that also through Instagram and the fear around that. And, and um, it's very, it's so visceral for, for me, but anybody who has quit the full-time job, left the plantation, if you will, to then start to this journey of, of independence and entrepreneurship, it's not easy. Ooh. So what's your journey been like? You what what led you to, to finally making the move? That's the hardest part. To you, find honestly, my boss, like I was just over my job. And yes. I, I remember telling Darrell, I was like, yo, I can't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. Like I'm, I'm at a desk. I'm literally not interacting with people. That's not, my spirit is just unhappy. And that's what were you doing I, before? So I was working for a tech startup. Uh, as an office manager, I was working for tech. I mean, you know, it was decent money. And it was interesting because I definitely... Um, learned a lot, you know, how people raise money and, you know, once again, how black folks, it's hard for them, you know, uh, my mm-hmm. old boss is white and her, her, was her and her husband and they, um, they're great people, but it was just even her as a woman, like, you know, just not being taken seriously in that space. Mm-hmm. So it, I'm, I'm grateful for the experience, but it was just like, I just couldn't be there anymore. So that's what had me take that leap of faith. Mm-hmm. And um, it was scary, but you know what, when I look back, it wouldn't have been as scary had I not been so materialistic because it was <laughs> the money. Like, I, yeah. I could have definitely, if there was a lifestyle that I just wasn't willing yeah. to give up. I mean, yeah. luckily, Darrell and I were living together at the time. Mm-hmm. So, you know, he kept things afloat. But I would have, mm-hmm. I probably wouldn't have done it had I not had that safety net, honestly. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, I was over it, but like, he was just so supportive. And he was like, listen, like, we're going to make it happen. Mm-hmm. I was like. I said, I want to eat ramen noodles. You know, I like a lobster tail every now and again. Jesus. <laughs> so that's how it went down. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so then what was your first step once you, once you let that job go? What was your first foray into? I, was, I started researching. Like, I was just like, all right, listen, you know what to do, but now you have to educate yourself the business side of it. Like, how are people getting jobs? what what is required and things of that nature so i started doing that i um redid my resume to have it you know read as a stylist Mm -hmm. and i started searching every job imaginable and i started applying for everything and let me tell you something i applied to things that i was only 30 percent qualified for like i met 30 percent of the qualification but i'm like that's what america does like i think as black people and as black women you know we are so like hard on ourselves and think we have to check every box and I mean it's good if you can but the reality is a lot of jobs you, you can get in the door and do it you know yeah. you, 
you can do it. It's not going right. to take, you know, unless you're going for a rocket scientist gig. Now I would say you need the degrees and the training. But so I just started and I just started putting it out on social media and was like, I'm a stylist. And I started thinking about other ways outside of, you know, booking jobs. Like how could I make money myself? And I started personal shopping and I started virtual styling and things of that nature. And my first official styling gig was for a Google web series. I was um, asked to be the assistant costume designer. I had a call with the costume designer and she loved my energy. And she was like, listen, this is my first time. I'm transitioning from stylist to costume design. It's my first time. I want to bring you in. We're going to learn this thing together. And it was like, great. Two weeks. It was amazing. And how did you get to that? How did you make that contact? Oh, networking. I'm telling you, people, network, network, network. I was on set... I was on set for a commercial. Actually, that wasn't even my first gig. A, a girlfriend I had met years ago asked me to help her um, do a, publicity, a promo. And she was like, I have the clothes, but I like need you to put it together. And I believe like someone, I feel like one of my girlfriends that I knew like couldn't do the job and she passed my name along. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't anything I had knew about or applied for. It literally was like, oh, my girlfriend. And like my girlfriend had that, much confidence in me to even yeah. put my name in the basket so right yeah that's how that happened yeah there's definitely something to be said about you know not so there's networking sure but then there's letting people know what you do and them really recognizing it because you do it well i think that really the key is letting people know this is what i do and i do it well and then you know your friends and your peers and your colleagues start saying, well, if that's what she says she is, and that's the proof that I see on her Instagram or however she's posting it, it must be true. So let me hire her for something. Right, right. Yeah, definitely. I mean, say, <laughs> say what you are and do your best at it. Because like I said, I'm, I'm pretty sure my girlfriend would not have been like, oh, my girlfriend's a stylist. And then I would right. look crazy or I didn't have any, you know, I didn't have a website at the time. That was mm -hmm. something um, I got later on, but um, I just like started networking and people believed in me and I'm, I'm grateful for that because that's yeah. how I've gotten, I'm pretty sure, 80, 85% of my jobs. Yeah, word of mouth, right. I, I think with creatives, that really is the bulk of our business comes from word of mouth. Our reputation precedes it if, if we have a great work ethic, but yeah, yeah, that's true. What gets us to where, where we get to. So then with the... Uh, did you say Google? It was a Google web, web series. Google web series. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, so, so you got that from also from a, a referral or contact. Referral. Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. Did they, they reached out to you or? Um, so yeah, my girlfriend had put my name in the pot and then, like I said, the costume designer reached out to me and we went from there and I met some amazing, amazing people. Mm -hmm. Like I, I got, from that job, I ended up booking another job. It, it, it just, it, it ended up spiraling. And I was just so grateful. And also LA is a big city. It's a big county. So, and I mean, anybody who lives here knows, like if you live in the Valley, it's hard to meet people who live in Inglewood because you're not really spending that much time over there and vice versa. Right. So, but like, you know, when you get on these jobs, you meet all people from all walks of life and living on different sides of the um, city. Right. And it, just, it, it worked out. It worked out well. I'm so grateful for that opportunity. And so what, was, what, what did you find the difference between like styling a few pieces for a friend to now costume designing for a show? Oh my God. So uh, the difference is like, you have to make the characters come to life, but from the writer and the producer and director's uh, viewpoint, right? Mm -hmm. So you work with them. Well, the costume designer, I mean, I was assisting, but you work with them and you read the script and you get a feel of how this person is going to be. So if the script is like, you know, she spends a lot of time at home, you're not going to have her in evening gowns, right? Because realistically, nobody at home, except for like Josh Michael Gore and whoever else. Right, I was thinking Regine from Living Single, right. Right, spent, <laughs> Regine, right, spent time in evening gowns at home. So that's what you have to do. You have to read the script and you have to make the characters look, come to life and mm -hmm. make it believable. So that was the difference with that. I mean, you know, when you're, personally styling someone you're for me I'm elevating their style but they're still 
themselves versus mm -hmm. an actor is a character. So I'm not mm -hmm. styling the actor, I'm styling the character. So mm -hmm. that's- And so, and so with the characters, because I'm assuming there's several, how, how many characters were on this particular? <sighs> so we had seven main characters. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they all worked in, um, it was some roommates and people worked together and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. um, it was a lot, but my costume designer, she was so organized and she knew like, you know, this is what we're going to do. So, you know, you get looks together, you have the um, actors try on, you do, you do fittings and then you organize it by rack and by scene. And we take mm -hmm. pictures for continuity. Um, you know, a lot of movies nowadays, I ain't going to name no director, you know, if you're missing that continuity, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you do things that nature, but it's just, it, it, once, once you get the look, it's just all about maintaining it and keeping it organized. Mm -hmm. As you talk about continuity, the, the one thing that always catches my eye I, in television yeah. and films is the bottom of, of people's shoes when they're brand new. <laughs> <laughs> With a sticker, be like, oh, the sticker's worse. Oh, goodness. <laughs> it was like, I guess they just floated onto the set and just have not walked in this person's shoes. It's uh, so crazy. Or a missing earring. Oh, I, oh, I haven't seen that one. <laughs> oh, you're like, did she really walk out? She had two pits. Did she get oh, to a fight? Did she take it off? Was it bothering right. her? Was it too heavy? It was I know. Now you can't even focus on the story. <laughs> right. Because I'm trying to figure out, like, what, what happened to take off that one earring? So. Right. Uh, what was my other question? Was she talking about? Oh, okay. So it's like, you know, when you're doing a job, there's things that you can prepare for because you have the experience to know this might arise. So then let me just have this in my back pocket just in case. But when you're starting something new, there's obstacles that you don't know are going to happen. So was there anything that happened on this particular job where it's just like, that's, I'll, I'll be prepared for that next time? You know what? I didn't have a style kit. So What's like, a style I'll, kit? So it's a style Okay, every style should have double-sided tape, scissors, clips. You know, when you see when you see a lot of publications, a lot of clothes are fit perfectly for the model or the actress or whoever. But mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, we have to make magic. So when you see a cinch right. in place, not necessarily we had a tailor on sight to sink that waist in you we bundled it up in the back and clipped it and then voila mm -hmm. there's magic so mm -hmm. i just you know when we were needing to do um a few touch-ups i didn't have a bag and we were constantly going to our costume designers bag so that was just something i was like Ugh, you know so i literally got home got my paycheck and i went on amazon ordered my bag <laughs> started like you know adding and it was stuff you know you once google is your best friend so mm -hmm. I Googled, like, you know, what should a stylist have in her bag? And then, you know, as time went on and I went on jobs and I was, I was learning stuff, you know, I would work under people and I was like, oh, they have this in their kit and things of that nature. Mm -hmm. And just, I learned um, when you're cleaning like a rough uh, sneaker, like, you know, Adidas, Stan Smith, well, not even Adidas, the shell toes, you know, they had like that, um, that popcorn. Like a wave. Yeah. yeah whatever. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I clean my sneakers with soap and water, but you can actually take alcohol and a clean white rag and wipe the dirt off. It comes off a lot easier. I didn't know that. That was, you know, something I learned or, you know, take, taping up the shoe. It was, it was a lot. But that oh, was that's right. Taping the bottom. Right. Yeah. Because a lot of, you know, your budgets aren't as big as people mm -hmm. think they are. So a lot mm -hmm. of stuff goes back. So you're not trying yep. to damage. So, yeah, mm -hmm. that was the one thing I learned. And like, mm -hmm. I'm till this day study adding um to my bag mm -hmm. so at this point are, are you um how, how do you put do you have an agent or you are you no so i don't have an agent it's funny okay. i have a girlfriend who represents stylists and um makeup artists hair artists and i'm just not big enough honestly you don't get an agent until like you're booking those jobs and you're willing to pay that percentage um mm -hmm. And with the pandemic, things have just gotten so funky. I mean, I, I, I can imagine you know what's going on. Um, jobs yeah. are uh, scarce and yeah. 
a lot of people aren't willing to sign contracts. It's, it's just so, I, I wasn't, at first I thought, I was like, oh, I need an agent. But the reality is I've been booking uh, jobs on my own. Yeah. And, um, you know, until that, that's been working. And, you know, until yeah. I get to a status where, you know, I have bigger name clients and um, I'm just in such high demand, you know, I don't yeah. have an agent and everything I'm booking on my own. I, I love that we're talking that this is coming up because this is something I think that runs the gamut, no matter what um, position you hold in the industry is that we're always going to be procuring our own work, no matter what part of life we are, no matter if we're just at the starter stage or if we're advanced and have some full career, but we're still, like you said before, with our relationships, um, reaching out to people to get those opportunities. I think it's a great um, skill to have to be able to, to do it on your own now and for as long as you possibly can without the help. Yeah, and, and, you know, I am, and also creating your own work, right? You don't have to wait, you know, as a stylist, you know, you always want to look book in um, your portfolio, things of that nature. And, you know, when gigs are dry, you know, I, I I have a tr I have issues with getting in front of the camera. I, I don't get in front of the camera as often as I should, mm -hmm. but um, I just met a photographer and I'm like, listen, we need to do some looks, whether it's on me. Utilize the people around you. I mean, I know as an actress, um, you've written stuff and you've produced and done your own thing. You can't wait around for people, you know, yeah. and you want to continue to keep your creative juices flowing, so as a stylist, actress, producer, photographer, whatever, like, mm -hmm. we find create ways. your own. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. So then speaking of the pandemic, because yeah, pretty much work ceased for everyone. Um, everyone. I know commercials continue to go. I know writers are still writing, but for the most part, everything stopped. Mm -hmm. So uh, what have you, what's, what's been keeping you, your creative juices flowing during this time, especially in, in regards to styling and fashion? You know what? I, I have to be honest with you. In the beginning, I was like, F everything. I, I just, yeah. I was just in, um, <laughs> I don't know if I just I didn't want to believe that this was happening to us. Like, I literally yeah. was like, because I had just can't, I had just come off a gig for the Super Bowl. I worked with J-Lo's team for the oh, Super Bowl. we got to come back to that, but let's, let's stay right here. <laughs> like, I was just like, all right, 2020, you can start right. off right. I'm ready. Mm -hmm. This yeah. pandemic smacked right. the living out of us. And I was like, yeah. so I honestly think I went into a moment of depression. I don't know how deep because I think I'm a very high functioning person. So even during um, times of despair, like people don't know because I'm like constantly, I'm moving, I'm yeah. shaking, I'm laughing, I'm talking. So for a, for, for a while, I, yeah, I, I literally was just like, I'm not doing anything. Like, I just was like, we were drinking. We had bottles of wine on deck. We were <laughs> eating food that we should not have been eating. Like, we, like, I think we were just like, all right, F it. We're just going to blow our weight away for, like, the first month. And then, mm -hmm. um, I don't know who it was. Somebody on Instagram was like, listen, we're going to be in this thing for the long haul. So, like, put the bottle down, put the bad foods down. <laughs> like, you don't want to come out of this thing 400 pounds. And I was yeah. like, oh, okay. And, but then I was like, okay, all right, I got to start making money. Like, and how, what does that look like? And I, like I said, it already been virtual styling. So I had a little hesitation because I was like, how am I going to ask people to buy clothes? when we're in a pandemic and people can't even pay their rent, like read the right. don't be insensitive. So it was very yeah. rough for me as a stylist to start, you know, doing that. But I had a girlfriend who had got offered a new job and she was like, listen, I do not want to go on a Zoom call looking homeless. Can you like help me look for some looks? And then I noticed like, oh, people still shopping. Okay. I, okay, I guess I could, you know, start, you know, marketing and promoting that I was still doing it. And I don't do it as much like I should. I, I need a marketing person. So anybody who's watching this, I need my website revamped and I need a good marketing team. But, um, so that's how I slowly get into it. But it, like I said, it was rough because I'm like, this pandemic hit so many people financially. 
um, we were blessed. We didn't, and you know, miss a beat. But I just was like, how can I be like, yeah, cop these new hundred dollar sneakers? And people are like, yeah, I don't know how to keep my lights on. So right. that was rough. But once I learned, like, okay, people are still, you know, it's, it, new jobs are still happening. Um, when jobs started picking back up, you know, people didn't want to show up on Zooms crazy. So that mm-hmm. was something I was able to do. And I'm still doing it. And I just got asked to work a pilot on NBC that I'll be starting hopefully tomorrow. I took a COVID test today. So hopefully. That's tomorrow. exciting. Yeah. That is exciting. Well, I'll check back in by the time I air your episode to see what's <laughs> going on with that. Yes. Um, but okay. So, so you've been helping people virtually style from their closet well from their closet and if they do have money we can buy new things i've always been i've always shouted from the rooftops wear your closet because a lot of us especially women we say we don't have nothing to wear but we got clothes full of tags we like oh i i put it up on it right so just like you know helping people be realistic like okay listen you probably ain't gonna wear that little black dress no time soon, but so we could put that. But oh, that white button up, you can definitely wear that because I'm also all about when you look good, you feel good, right? So like I put this red lipstick on today and I was like, oh, okay, sis, you look cute. Versus earlier today, I was just like, oh my God, I, I look homeless, <laughs> Darrell's probably gonna leave me. Let me get dressed. No, he's not, right. But, um, yeah, so definitely styling people from their closet and having people revamp their closet because this is just our new normal. So what does that look like? How do I still look presentable, feel good, you know, be able to wear clothes and take care of my kids and not worry about it getting stained and things of that nature. So that's what I've been doing. Okay, so now we're going to go back to the J-Lo and the Super Bowl. How'd you get that job and what was that no. experience like? Oh, oh my God. if you have never heard of a lady named Sean Barton, let me just tell you, BZ is the woman. <clears throat> Remember the Biggie video, Hypnotized? They were on the yeah. top. The brown yeah. skin lady with the bl- short blonde hair? Yeah. Thanks to her. <laughs> okay. She did, she's a costume designer and a stylist, okay? Mm-hmm. She's she styled Biggie all of them. She styled Outkast. She did Ottawa. Like she is. Oh, awesome. Ottawa was beautiful. Um, so her best friend is Monica Payne. Um, she's in the music and she's a music exec. But I met Monica Payne. She's you know me. I'm a very friendly person. So I met her yeah. out in the streets of L.A. Mm-hmm. And I when I realized I wanted to do costume, well, styling and costume design, I had reached out to uh, Monica and I said, hey, like, you know, I want to ask Sean. And she's like, reach out to her. Like, she's very open. And mm-hmm. I reached out to her initially in 20, 2017 or early 2018. Mm-hmm. No, it was 2018. It was 2018, sorry. And um, it took a while for her to get back to me, but she, her promise was, as soon as I am parked, like I'm home and I can really like, we're gonna talk. She mm-hmm. kept her promise because she reached out to me early 2019 to work the Grammys and be on her team for JLo's, for JLo's team for background, help us uh, dress the background dancers. Mm-hmm. That's a heck of a, a, a line item on your resume. <laughs> And then she remembered me and said she wanted me down to Miami with her for the Super Bowl. So two years straight, I've been able to rock with um, her and JLo's team. And it's been one of the most amazing um, things to date on, as far as my professional life. I mean, JLo is... So... <sighs> when you have that longevity in your career, that's because you work your ass off That's and right. you have morals and values and you have a team that believes in you and you believe in your team. And that's all that I have seen in both times that I've worked with them. It has been amazing. Um, the Super Bowl was very, very strenuous. I mean, they don't play no games. We rehearsed. Um, this was <laughs> the background dancers had um Versace had uh, made their uh, outfits and her outfit uh, or outfits, but she wanted more bling. So me and the team had to hand, okay, 
we had to hand glue all these stones and i was like lord have mercy call me a rhinestone queen i'm putting that on my resume as well um it was hard but it was beautiful and i i had the most incredible team it was it was dope so yeah that's how but i think it's a testament to like my work ethic right like right. i worked for her for you know back in 2019 and she saw that i worked and you know i'm not afraid to get dirty and she was like yeah bring her back so that's i'm right. grateful for that Oh, that's a great story. Now, yeah. uh, now let me go back to, because you were talking about um, the pandemic and the onset and what it felt like um, for you. And, um, you know, I feel like a lot of people felt, you know, whatever it was, despair, the, 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 the main keyword, uncertainty, you know, whatever. But um, for me at the top of it, it was like, thinking it was just going to be a couple of weeks, but then re really recognizing that it was going to be even longer. And now you're telling us we have no idea when it's going to happen. Um, yeah, we did the same thing. We started eating carbs, sugar, and, and interspersed with some vegetables. But yeah, that was, that was it. And the emotions were just all over the place. So, you know, for me, it was the balance of being okay with it and, and then not being okay with it. But it, was that your experience too? You know, I didn't want to extend myself in grace initially because I, I, I just, I, I, after I realized that this was going to be a long term thing and I had to get, I, I, I started seeing these memes. People were like, if you don't come out of this pandemic with a skill and da da da, and no pressure. I was ready to throw my computer or my phone. I don't know where I was watching it or saw the meme, but I was just like, yo, if you come out alive and with a roof over your head, you have done something completely incredible. Yeah. Because what, what I had to, I, I guess it was so much, right? So it was a pandemic, right? The job dried up or not dried up, but halted, getting married, had to change the plans. Um, because we were at home, the racism and the systemic racism and the racial, like that was just magnified by a thousand, right? It, it was nothing new, but because we were home and we had our televisions on and we had no other outlet. And mm -hmm. then let's be honest, I love my husband, but being around him 24 seven was something I had to get used to because we both were able to go to our jobs and do our things and then come home. We had at least eight hours of freedom, you know? Yeah. So that was something else. It was just, yeah. it was so many changes at once, Tawana. I was just like, yo. Mm -hmm. And at first I was like, okay, you could do this. If you could do this. And like my mind started going, I was like, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. Checklist and to-do list. And I was like, pause, extend yourself grace. Take a moment acknowledge all of it right because i think mm -hmm. i didn't want to acknowledge the fact that um i had to cancel my big wedding and i wasn't going to have my bridal shower and i wasn't going to have my bachelorette party and i wasn't going to see my mama for a while and you know it's just a lot i was like acknowledge it because i didn't want to acknowledge it. i literally was like i'm not going to think about it and my girlfriend was like girl you can have a pity party like get on that floor and cry it's yeah. okay this was something big in your life like you right. know it's like I, we get it nobody's gonna look at you i guess i felt guilty because i'm like here i am right. you know complaining all about the atrocities right and all the right i was just like gee but no i, I had to it valid it was valid yeah. i extended myself grace on that and that's how i was able to move forward like i like accepted i acknowledged and then you know how old am i 36. I would say about 33, I started learning to check off things I could control and throw things I couldn't control into the sea. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's a, it's a work in progress, but there was that, that, that's how I approached this pandemic. I'm like, all right, what can you control? Like, what are you able to do to move forward in life and, you know, mm -hmm. to make money, to make a change to whatever. And that's mm -hmm. when it, like the virtual styling thing, and having park dates like you know i'm like okay Ooh, i love can't, that we can't you know do anything and at this time restaurants weren't offering any but you know 
uh, me and Darrell would get together. We have another girlfriend who um, we've been in contact during the pandemic, and we would go to the park, separate, you know, six feet. We I would have it. food, and you know, we would just sit out and talk. And it was just the most like we're actually having one on Saturday. Like we were like, yeah. it, it, it's just something that brought joy. But it was like you know, I had to keep reminding myself. Hold on a second. We're going to so get what, it back. What can you do? And what can't yeah. you do? What can't you control? And yeah. Uh-oh. Did you lose me? Uh, I did for a second, but you're back oh, now. Okay. okay. Cool, cool, cool. Yeah. But I, I think just moving forward, I mean, even with this election, <laughs> um, just remembering what you can control, go for it. And what you can't, let it go. Yeah. For real. So. Yeah. I feel like, um, you know, that, that lesson of extending yourself grace is something that we're hopefully for those of us who recognize it and have the wherewithal to do so, uh, it's, it's going to be a long-term beneficiary way of being, uh, going forward. Yes. Yes. Because who Um, knows what else is coming around that corner. But in the meantime, we did have this for what? It's how many months are we now? Six months? I mean, it, it, it's crazy, but mm-hmm. um, yeah, just do what you can and mm-hmm. don't let social media, don't let nan person tell you what you should be doing. Do what feels right. right to you. You know what I mean? I think um, we can get caught up even before the pandemic. I can get caught up on, you know, yeah. seeing people you know, moving a certain way and like, oh, I should. And it's like, no, it's no. interesting. Um, I mean, I, I, I don't know if you can hear the list because I have my um, Invisalign in, but mm. I was just talking to a girlfriend this morning um, because I posted my orthodontist on my Insta stories. She's mm-hmm. working with um, uh, some nonprofit and she's helping like a hundred kids with their smiles, like it's amazing. But I was like, that's why I love my orthodontist. But it's been a while. I one of my insecurities has always been my teeth. But um, I didn't suck my thumb. I just have a narrow um, upper jaw, right? So my like my jaw is like like this instead of being so like this. Growing. That's how my teeth started growing in. Uh-huh. And when I was in Jersey, before we moved down to North Carolina, like I had braces and a retainer at top and then we moved to North Carolina. My mom lost her insurance. I never got my braces put back on. And then college, I guess it wasn't on my to-do list. And then when I moved out here, I was told that I was gonna have to get jaw surgery. So that deterred me from doing it because I'm like, A, I don't got $20,000 for jaw surgery. B, I actually like the way I look. So I do I want it? Yeah. The structure of my face. But all that, I say all that to say this, 2018 was was just an amazing year because I had a girlfriend who worked for the show, The Doctors, and she said, Mm -hmm. hey, G, we have a dentist coming on, and do you want to be a part? They look at people with jacked up teeth, and I said, sign me up, and (laughs) (laughs) she said, you know, I can't really tell you, you know, I don't know what they're going to do for you, but, you know, I'm like, all right, whatever, even if they say we'll give you free cleanings for two years. Like that's better yeah. than nothing. Right. I go on the show, I meet the dentist, Dr. Dorfman. He does extreme makeover and things of that nature. He was like, Mr. McLaughlin, like, you know, you do have a lot of overcrowding, da, 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 but we're going to fix your teeth and we're going to start today. I'm getting my whole teeth fixed. Like this is my second year of Invisalign, free 99. And I'm getting veneers afterwards. Wow. The only thing I pay for is my teeth cleaning every six months. That is a blood. That is a gift. So, like, I mean, that's another thing where I'm like, yo, things work out when they're supposed to. So, like, I've been hard on myself thinking my career should be at a certain level. Um, I want to be, you know, in the union, and that's hard because, you know. The rules have t- changed, you know, back in the day, I thought I was going to get Taft Hartley and all that good stuff, but you know, but yeah. I am learning when it's my time, it's my time. Yeah, man. It's my time. So while I'm waiting, continue to be active, creative, continue to help out, give back, 
Um, I have a girlfriend who started a um, Los Angeles, Black Los Angeles business page on IG. So she's been like highlighting all the black businesses and she did a, um, she did a giveaway. She asked me, you know, whoever won the giveaway, could I offer them a free virtual styling session? You know, mm -hmm. it's just doing, doing what you can do and lead the rest up to God. Yeah, really? absolutely. I think there's something that's extraordinarily powerful about just being present in your lane and taking it step by step. And, you know, we live in Los Angeles where everybody out here is, is I, I won't say the hustle train, I, I don't really care for that term, but everybody out here is striving to be the, the, the thing that they wanna be. Mm -hmm. And so it's so easy to see somebody in your peripheral doing what you want to do or doing something similar to be like, well, how do you, how is she doing it? And then start the comparison. But then the strength comes from, you know what, sis, I see you, I wish you well, but that's not what you're doing. It's not what I'm doing because my journey is leading me to something else. And there's just so much power in, in staying the course and focusing on your own, your own journey. You have to, you have to, because comparison is the devil and on top of that you don't know how you do not know folks walks of life like that you don't know what people went through to get where they are or what they're going through mm -hmm. i mean i have known people who on the outside look great but were sleeping in their cars mm -hmm. like you would think like oh they're doing it but they didn't have a roof over their head right. so you just never know what people are going through so like truly knowing that you are you and they are they their journey is their journey your journey is your journey and both journeys are beautiful preach that there it is <laughs> um what what are you finding inspiring during this time lovecraft country <laughs> i haven't started yet i i know i gotta sit down i know it's a sit down and focus to, i'm just going to grab i'm going to i'm going to grab um all just aside I, I haven't been I've been watching like old shows, like, you know, Moesha came out, Living Single, Girlfriends. I'm just inspired that by that, by the masses. Because, you know, unfortunately, when those shows dropped back in the day, it was just us loving on it and just us who knew it. But yeah. now the masses, the world is getting to see like how dope we've been. Like this is nothing new. So yeah. that's inspiration. But Lovecraft, Lovecraft Country. Okay. The episode last night. No spoilers Wait, I can't for me. Talk about it. I can't even talk about it. But okay. that, um, I'm finding joy in going back, like you said, to the basics. So um, now that we're parked, waking up and actually having a moment to meditate and pray. You know, before the pandemic, I was missing those days because I had to get up and I had to be somewhere at this. I had to be on set at six. And I was only setting my alarm clock for 530 just to get up fresh teeth and get there. You know, <laughs> but this is like you said, the, the pandemic, it's, it's, it's unfortunate financially. And, you know, our leadership has been a hot mess, but it also has made us sit still and sit with ourselves and, you know, like you said, go back to the basics and s start from scratch or just learn how to be okay with things. So yeah, but Lovecraft Country. Okay. I can't be a butler. I'm, not, I'm going, it, it puts me in that mind frame. So I said for the right. month of October, I'm going to go revisit some of, um, I think I'm gonna start with Kindred one of my favorite books by, by her, so. And, but. and I'm listening to now uh, Parable of the Sower. Ah. So, which, yes. which is really um, prophetic for what we're dealing with right now. Oh, yes. And yeah. Black people in a sci-fi mysticism world. Oh, yeah. I think, that's gonna be November. I think that's gonna be my November read. I'm gonna go back to that in November. But yeah, I was just also just relishing in that, my friends and family are healthy and safe and we're mm. all in this thing together. I'm so grateful. Um, I, I've known a few people who have lost, my cousin lost her dad, who was like one of my first father figures. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so there has been some losses that I'm grateful overall that like, you know, we are all still smiling and 
still helping and looking out for each other and you're doing this and you're giving us creatives, you know, an outlet and we're talking. What y'all doing? Yeah. What y'all doing? You know, and although people fuss about social media, I'm also grateful because social media has kept us together and I'm connecting more with people, you know, friends I haven't talked to since junior high and things of that nature, like really checking up on people. Mm -hmm. So I appreciate that. You know, I, I try to see the good in everything. And this pandemic has definitely brought my friends and I closer, people, just everything. And just also being grateful for the smallest things. Like I'm like literally grateful that I have AC and it's going to be a hundred degrees in the valley today. <laughs> yeah. So right. yeah. I love this. Thank you for talking to me, Miss Genevieve McLaughlin Giles. Oh, that sounds so good. Girl, I need to make this a plan and get this on a t-shirt. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm glad that you guys made it work. And you know, it's it's hard to make things work, but you did it and it was beautiful. Thank you so, so much. Until next time, sister. All right, Mr. Wana. Have a wonderful day. <laughs> you too. Bye. Be well. Bye. Bye. Thank you for watching Creators in Quarantine. Things work out when they're supposed to. Ah, oh, thank you, Genevieve. And be sure to give yourself grace. In the meantime, subscribe, and I'll catch you on another project. This concludes Creators in Quarantine. Until next time.